Hugh Brown intro take three. Today we have a very special guest joining us, Hugh Brown. He was a multiple best-selling author and Australian documentary photographer. His photographic life began after he left his law studies and management consulting career to move to Western Australia's Kimberley region. He has worked in over 30 countries, capturing beauty in our rapidly changing world. In 2010, he committed to documenting the work and lives of the artisanal and small-scale miners around the world. His Garampiros project documents the world's poorest miners, working in extreme and difficult working conditions. Thanks again for joining us on The Rocks. If you like what you hear and want to catch past conversations, please make sure to subscribe. Now let's dive in. Well, Hugh, thanks so much for joining me on the rocks today. It's it's early my time, so I'm I'm just having a coffee. But where are you calling in from today? I'm in Western Australia. I'm in the far north, about 3,200 kilometres north of Perth, so about 2,000 miles north of Perth. And uh, we're in the middle of the wet season, so outside we've got all these um, frogs and had a snake out there earlier. So it's whatever else. It's um, it's an interesting part of the world. That's the first time I went to Australia, it was to meet my mother-in-law. And within five minutes of meeting her at her farm outside of Brisbane, she told me about like the 10 different animals at the farm that could kill me if I touched them. And I wasn't sure if it was just scare me off or if that was like really, but it really is Australia. There's so much running around out there. Well, we got crocodiles, some big crocodiles, not uh, probably three or four kilometers from where I am now. And uh, I saw an Aboriginal lady the other day down at the crossing and I thought I was going to have to pull her out of the jaws of a crocodile because they're two just downstream from the crossing. And she was drunk as she'd had probably 150 beers too many and um, just was about to go for a swim. So it wouldn't have been a good situation. Well, you are in a really interesting spot in the mining industry. I, I would wonder, first of all, if you consider yourself part of the mining industry, but could you tell us a little bit about what you do and your story? It's so unique. I'm a documentary photographer, but I've spent probably 30 years on and off involved with the mining industry. My first job, Vax student out of uni, was actually the world's largest mining company. I'm working on the 46th floor in Melbourne. And over the years, I've had on and off involvement, first in that capacity, then as a management consultant, and then in other varying capacities before I became a photographer. I became a photographer, I think, about full-time near, nearly 20 years ago. And over that time, I've photographed large-scale mines around the world. There's probably not too many aspects of the value chain that I haven't photographed, if any, worked a heap of different commodities. And then 15 years ago, I started photographing artisanal mining. And that's become a somewhat of a, you know, a passion since that time. And do I consider myself part of the mining industry? I think you'd probably consider me, my, me as being a, hopefully a dispassionate and an objective observer. And I can see good aspects of large scale mining, I can see good aspects of small scale mining. And then on the on the flip side, I can see difficulties with both. So, you know, I don't feel that I have any, you know, I'm compromised in any way. I feel that I can generally say it as, as what I think it is. And, and hopefully that makes a contribution to people's understanding and knowledge of both subjects. Yeah, I mean, I first of all, love your photographs and the work that you do. And I think it really brings people, especially on the artisanal side, into the reality of what it looks like on the ground, which in many cases, I think people don't quite understand. But you always talk with such dignity and respect about the work that people do on the artisanal side. And, and what an important economic force it is in those communities. Could you tell me a little bit about how you started to pay closer attention to the artisanal side? What drew you into that? Yeah, I was asked by a client back in uh, 2006 to do a trip to Africa to shoot their operations over there. I nearly flicked the, the assignment to a mate of mine who I studied law with. And he, funnily enough, he, he and I were the only two in, in our law intake that um, became photographers. But after sort of a bit of thought, I decided to go and then literally it was only a two-week trip and in the course of that two-week trip, I saw these miners mining beside the roadside. I'd never seen anything like it. It took me back to sort of visions of the gold rush back in, you know, developed world gold rushes back in the 1850s or thereabouts. Uh, I did another trip to, a long trip to Africa in 2008 and then over the next few years, I, I returned many, many times. And in the process, I would have my driver stop beside the roadside and I'd get out and go and photograph these miners periodically and briefly. And then in 2010, I decided after you know talking with someone back here in Perth that I would do a book on these people. And I had no idea... Had no idea how I was going to fund it. You know, had no idea how I was going to sell it because back in, in 2010, artisanal mining wasn't really topical. I know Obama sort of came through with Dodd Frank around that time, but at the time, 
you know, no one was talking about artisanal mining. So it was very much a, a labor of love. And then I got stuck in, did my first dedicated assignment on that project back in 2010 and then continued on since then. And I'm deeply passionate about the project. And if you asked me back in 2010, I couldn't tell you why. It just felt deeply important. And now over sort of the last 10 or 12 years, the sense of importance has has remained and I've been able to flesh out how I think this project can add value to the industry and decision makers around the world. Having worked in a lot of emerging and frontier markets and really like post-conflict or active conflict countries, in every country in the world, people wake up every morning and try to make a better life for their kids, right? They try to go out, earn a living to be able to pay for their kids to go to school if they can or just survive, right? And it's this common sense that people are so ingenuitive and are ingenious and creative and really, you know, wake up every day trying to find a way to make the next day better, right, for their families and their communities. And I really get that sense when I look at your work that sometimes I feel people don't understand that about the communities that are really actively involved in artisanal mining. It's very dismissive and and people look down on it and just think of it as a legal activity, right, that's environmentally and socially and and health-wise harmful. And it's like, People don't go do that, <laughs> right, with, with ill intent or because they're, you know, because they're not trying to work hard and improve what's going on in their family and their lives. There's got to be a way to support that in some way. And I, you probably have a lot of visibility into what works and what doesn't work with that kind of engagement. Uh, there's two really big mistakes we make using values of the current day to judge actions taken in history. And the second is to use differing socioeconomic circumstances to make judgments between very disparate economic groups of people. So, And the problem here that I have with a lot of the stuff that happens in artisanal mining is essentially we've got the wealthiest 1% of people in the world making judgments about how the poorest group of people in the world should be living their lives. And I think it's incredibly hypocritical. I think it's incredibly problematic. People don't seem to understand why that's so problematic because we're trying to overlay our circumstances and what we would tolerate into the worlds and circumstances of those people in other countries. And I often say to people, I say, well, how would we go if those people in the third world cast judgments on how we did things in the first world? We'd laugh at them and tell them to go and take a running jump off a long pier. But somehow we don't see the problem with that if we judge those people. I think you and I, judging from some of our LinkedIn (laughs) conversations, share a frustration that people don't really understand how challenging it is to operate in a lot of these places and operate in a respectful and sustainable way just at all. And to expect things to change overnight or to expect them to adopt our ways of thinking and acting are just completely unreasonable and not fair. I think the other challenge as well is the motivations of what's coming out of the developed world. And I've had it put to me that things like, you know, like responsible sourcing and sustainable sourcing ultimately were consumer driven. But I would challenge that and suggest that maybe a lot of those movements were legislative driven and driven by big business to some extent. The reason I say that is because, you know, most of the major initiatives in those areas have come out of, you know, Dodd-Frank, Section 1502, OECD due diligence guidelines, CARA um, legislation out of the EU. They're what is ultimately driving behaviour. I'm not saying there's not a lot of good people out there that are wanting to achieve benefit for these people, but I also wonder and question whether a lot of what has happened is related to the developing world wanting to secure mineral supply chains for the next 50 years. And I know that's probably controversial to say that, but it's just a feeling that I have. And so I look look at a lot of what's going on through a prism of, you know, are people really concerned about these people or is it some institutions and places looking to secure mineral supply chains? And I'll give you an example of, you know, what really tweaked me to that. That was a, f- a year or two back when I was talking to someone out of Germany in West Africa And I said, what are you guys really doing here? And they said, well, we're here ostensibly to sort of, you know, improve the livelihoods of these artisanal miners, but it's really about us wanting to secure lithium supplies for our electric vehicle industry. One of the major challenges that we have in artisanal mining and probably the major challenge is there's lack of alignment of objective. And because we've got so many different interest groups and so many different 
competing objectives, there's no alignment there. So if we're not getting alignment on the ground, how are we going to achieve meaningful change for the people that we're porting, purporting to want to help? Yeah, and I this what I'm about to say may also rub some folks the wrong way or be a bit controversial, but I have a personal opinion from my my work in Afghanistan and, and Iraq and, and a few other places that the aid money in particular, and I think some ESG or CSR efforts can kind of fall into that bucket. Aid and donor money to me is like an invasive species in a local community or country economic ecosystem. It comes in and disrupts in a really unsustainable way, how companies and people and communities interact within what what does work organically and what they have the ability to support. It's incredibly disruptive and typically not in a positive direction, right? It leads to higher levels of corruption. It usually has does not have the intended consequences of what the donors have in mind. You have a lot of people that come in from the developed world that are being paid really high salaries. Uh, to come and basically implement what I consider to be like white savior complex. So rather than paying a, an American $150,000, $200,000 a year with danger pay and over, you know, overtime and all that to come in and quote unquote, teach people how to do things better, why not donate that money to the community and let them effectively manage it themselves, right? And I think a lot of it comes down to that lack of respect and lack of trust of poor people. I mean, I grew up in a relatively poor part of America in, in rural Maine. And you see it even here, right? We don't we don't trust, quote unquote, poor people to manage their money. When in reality, those people are way more efficient and effective at making a dollar stretch <laughs> through a week than someone like me who goes and gets Starbucks every morning, right? I mean, that's what for some reason we don't we don't put those things together. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then you sort of overlay that with the, you know, the complexity of aid money being used as leverage. And then you also overlay that with what you're saying that, you know, if you've got the value chain of where the aid money goes, 80% of it probably ends up coming back to the donor country anyway, you know, through whether it be spent on security in Afghanistan or whatever else, for example. Unfortunately, these are the issues that don't really get teased out because the average punter on the ground doesn't understand the complexity of these issues. I've seen a lot, in, especially in like the conflict mineral space groups that I call semi-affectionately self-licking ice cream cones, where in places where you have people trying to improve the way that they're operating, trying to reduce corruption, trying to improve working conditions, right? Because they want a greater connection with the legitimate mining space in particular, there is no incentive for nonprofit or aid-based groups to report on that. Right. If they say things are getting better, if they say, actually, given the local context, this is a good way to operate, then they don't get any more money. <laughs> like the whole concept of funding these groups is based off of this idea of completely awful, dangerous, illegal conditions. And there's real no way for a lot of these communities and countries to kind of write their way out of these restrictions like Dodd-Frank and others, because the groups that are there are financially incentivized to keep saying they're doing a terrible job and it's awful and we need, you know, we need more. And it comes back to what I said earlier about the conflicting objectives between solution finders. So if there's no alignment and clarity on what the ultimate objectives are, then how do we know if anyone's having a win along the way? At the moment, everything's process driven, responsible sourcing, sustainable sourcing, even impact investing. I can understand why, because with so many different objectives in the mix, it's going to be almost impossible to agree on what the solution should be. And that's why, to some extent, I've recently following, you know, conversations with a colleague have moved away and said, well, if people are going to impose these solutions on artisanal miners, then the one immutable thing that no one should be able to argue against is that if we're going to put these miners out of work, then we've got to have somewhere else for them to go. We've got to have something else for them to do that pays the same amount of money that they're earning as they are in artisanal mining. And that's an objective I would hope that no one could disagree with. Yeah. And I think in particular, the dynamic between like the legitimate business space or what I would call like the, the legal business space and the black market or illegal space. I always struggled with folks in Afghanistan in particular to for people to understand that in many communities, there is no distinction. There's just business activity. And a lot of that's the reality of relationships between 
legitimate business owners and lawmakers, right? You've got corruption aspects, but things are so interwoven. And you have to be comfortable if you want to move people from black to white, you have to be comfortable with gray for a certain period of time, right? You can't just expect for things to to switch over. And I think in the Western world, we're so uncomfortable with the gray sometimes that it, it really holds us back from providing technical support, business support that would allow people to transition or, or scale up to something that a bigger company could interact with and have a legitimate business relationship with. And I, I think the other thing that's not happening is there's not enough thought being given to the projected impact of the solutions that are being proposed. So, you know, for example, if we want to assume that OECD, CARA, that they're not going away, then we need to look at, well, what are the likely implications of those guidelines and that legislation? And my strong sense on all of that is that the implications are going to be, is this going to, this is going to force people from the industry? And I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the day, the only people that are going to be able to comply with what's required under OECD and, and CAR and the like is the large scale companies. And just to give you some numbers, I mean, we've got 40 million artisanal miners directly employed around the world. And let's say they produce under 10% of global metals production or global minerals production. And then you've got the large scale miners with 7 million employees around the world directly employed, and they're producing over 90% of global minerals production. So if we see a transition from of people from the artisanal sector to the large scale sector, it's not going to be one for one. It's going to be one for, you know, for every eight employees that stand to lose their jobs, only one are going to get picked up in the in the large scale sector. And I don't think enough thought is being given to that and, and the implications of that and how we manage it. Everything's just focused on this process driven solution. And do you have any ideas on, on what you think would work? Like have you seen things or, or had ideas for things as you've been documenting in particular what's going on where you're like, wow, if only everybody would do this. I think what we're talking about fundamentally is a third world developmental issue. To some extent, that's beyond my pay grade. But what I can say is that if we're going to stimulate economic activity outside of artisanal mining, and and let's say, you know, some are going to get picked up in the large scale sector, but not many, what do they go and do? And I think it's incumbent on the solution finders that we have those battle plans in place before those changes are made, not afterwards, because it's not just right, it's not fair, it's not right to just go and dump those people on the street and say, right, this is life, fend for yourselves. That's not right. Yeah, and they, I mean, and they support so many people. In Afghanistan, for example, you know, a typical man in, in, in most families in Afghanistan is supporting around seven individuals through whatever work that he's doing. So when you put one, one minor out of work, you're really putting him plus seven more people in a really desperate financial situation. Are there certain countries that you've seen or experienced that you think have a better handle on how to how to do that? I think the problems vary, but this concept of transitioning the workforce from, say, an artisanal um, vocation to something else, you know, I think that problem is consistent everywhere. And I don't know that there's been the will to this point for the solution finders to want to say to solve it and. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get that on the agenda to say, well, we need to start getting policymakers, legislators, heads of major corporations to buy into a process that's going to start sort of working on this rather than just saying, you know, ultimately that's going to force a lot of them out of the industry. And, I, you know, there's someone in mind that had disagreed vehemently that, you know, artisanal mining has been around for hundreds or thousands of years and that it's not going away. And to some extent that person is right. But, On the flip side, the challenges we're facing now are different to what we've faced at any other time in human history, and that is we've got a global population of 7.6 to 7.7 billion people. We're running out of resources in the developed world, and there's only so many resources left on the planet, and that necessarily is going to pose big problems for the artisanal miners. And it's coincidental or maybe not that the rise of the responsible sourcing movement has coincided with a massive decline in mineral discoveries worldwide. And um, Frank Joostra, um came out with some numbers recently, the gold billionaire out of Canada. There was twice as much gold discovered in a single year in 1990 as there was around the world in the last 10 years. Isn't it coincidental that the rise of responsible sourcing and the pressure being put on 
artisanal miners just happens to coincide with increasing Western interest in third world mineral deposits. And those third world min- mineral deposits in the main are mined by artisanal miners. Yeah. And I wonder, what do you think about the other trend that I certainly see clearly happening, which is the drive for more American domestic production? We're seeing here in the U.S., uh, President Biden just yesterday um, was talking a lot about some some critical mineral projects that the U.S. government is supporting here in the U.S. And I wonder how that will impact you know what's going on in the developing world when it comes to mining investment, but also like you know what does that do to develop markets, right? If you have small mining communities that spring up, the, look, the problem you've got there with what Biden's trying to do is. All of these projects are long lead time projects and they can take 5, 10, 20 years to bring on stream. So the problem the US has got at the moment, as, as I understand, is that it's basically trying to unravel having been out, out foxed by China over the last 10 or 15 years. And what China did, as I understand, is it gained control of you know particularly rare earths. And then what it did was it squeezed supply and basically said to all the tech companies and the major tech companies in the US, unless they... Um, relocated their manufacturing plant to the US, then uh, to to China or or thereabouts, that they were going to sort of withhold supply. So America's now sort of trying to unravel that. Essentially, there's five um, locations left on the planet that are going to be more prospective for minerals. The first is polar regions, which are going to be very difficult to access in the short term, short to medium term. Um, The major wilderness regions, Alaska, the Amazon, the jungles of Central Africa, the subsea environment, and then into the asteroid belt. And so the fifth one of those and probably the easiest of those is going to be the third world. And that's why there's so much, we're seeing so much activity in that part of the world now. Yeah. And I think that's where, from a geopolitical perspective, and of course, we're we're taping this for the listeners um, on the day where Russia's invasion of Ukraine was, was kind of formally recognized or announced. But I think given the complexity geopolitically, you really do have essentially proxy wars that go on, for lack of a better word, around natural resources in the emerging markets. And I don't think most people understand that when countries or in particular state-owned mining companies go in and promise to build a mine, they typically also commit to building or financing infrastructure and aid money. And there are really complicated relationships then between those state-owned mining companies and the governments, right? Where oftentimes the government ends up owing, you know, the mining company or the the country behind it money and is really beholden to that contract. My personal perspective is that if we in the developing world that really are always pointing the finger at China predominantly, right, China going in and, and taking these resources or taking licenses and then having a really challenging relationship with the local government, if we don't want them to win, we got to get on the field. Right. If you don't like the values that that creating in these markets, then then we have to be willing to go in and compete. And frankly, we don't have state owned mining companies and our the U.S. government at least does not support American companies operating overseas nearly in the same way that China and some other countries do. And I would imagine you've seen a lot of the same dynamics. Otherwise, you know, they're, they're going to continue to do it. Yeah, certainly the Chinese have been very aggressive. They cop a lot of the um, they cop a lot of the bucketing. But I also think that the some of the major companies on the planet, some of the major gold companies, resource companies generally, I think they're a lot closer to the state than we um, we probably give credit. You know, certainly those companies are very active in places like Africa. I remember reading something not that long ago that the United States identified this as an issue, as, you know, back as far as the mid seventies and. They could see this happening. So I think they were just over the you know the course of a number of administrations were basically outfoxed by the Chinese and both in terms of access to important resources, rare earths, and then also appropriation of important technologies. And we're, we're, we're basically in an era of three superpowers now, Russia, the Chinese, and the United States. And it's going it's to be interesting to see how it plays out. And do you see that? at a very local level when it comes to mining activity and and artisanal activity? Because I've seen a a direct relationship and even like direction from, for example, Chinese buyers in Afghanistan, right? Where where they will come through Pakistan and direct local or artisanal miners on what they want mined and how they want it done, right? I mean, there's like an actual direct business relationship that goes on there. Have you seen that in other countries and its impact? Certainly through Africa, I've seen the Chinese everywhere. And, you know, it's 
building roads, it's building a parliament house in Malawi, things like that. I mean, we've all, anyone who's had any involvement with Africa has seen the extent of Chinese involvement. And they don't do that out of the goodness of their heart. They're usually getting access to minerals at the back end. And I think to some extent, I mean, I think this is where, you know, aid money is leveraged by the West as well to do the same thing. It's just we don't hear about it. Minerals are going to be finite and there's only so many places where you can find them. And I think the West is playing catch up on that front at the moment. And unfortunately, this is the the third world is ultimately going to, you know, we're seeing a sort of a a 2.0, 3.0 form of colonisation because, you know, at the end of the day, the third world is the one that's being stripped of its minerals. I have issues with that as well, you know, like what are we really giving back to these countries in return for taking the things that are important to them? You know, I think it'd be interesting to hear in, in your discussions and your relationships with artisanal miners in these communities, what, what is important to them? Like, what do they say about what's going on and what they wish were going on? You know, if you have to talk for artisanal miners, you'd say certain nationalities are liked are liked less than others. But at the end of the day, most of the miners that I've come across around the world are, are united by a common objective, and that common objective is they're sacrificing the lives they could be living now for, and I put in inverted co- in italics, the prospect of better lives for themselves, their families, and the people close to them, and that better life might be, it might enable them to buy a motorbike, it might enable them to buy a motor car, it might enable them to build a bigger house, it might enable them to send their kids to school, it might enable them to invest in property or businesses in other towns. And at the end of the day, when you, there's an interesting sort of parallel with what happens in the developed world, in, in, the, in the Western world, and we're doing exactly the same thing. It would be the same in America, it's the same here in Australia. You've got a lot of people sacrificing the lives they could be living now by, you know, working 80-hour weeks, by, you know, doing cleaning jobs that they hate, by um, doing labouring jobs, working in an office 80 hours a week, going away and working in the mines. They're all doing that because they want to make a better future for the people that are close to them. And so when you when you pair all of that back, we're ultimately all miners at heart. And even just that message I wish people would really sort of reflect on and and realise that even though, you know, we've got culture and we've got race and we've got geography and all these differences, we're ultimately united by the same things. I mean, I couldn't agree more. That's been my consistent experience anywhere I've worked. Again, I think that's where I have a deep respect for for what people do when they're engaged in that activity because you understand the motivation of why they do it, right? And and that's where I always wonder, and, and I think it different, differs a lot at a very local level, what would help people do it more effectively and safer and really progress economically faster? Because I know that that's why they're doing it. In Afghanistan, we did some projects with with local miners where it was, for example, purchasing or implementing centralized processing equipment to where at a, at a local community or tribal level, you had individual miners, but then they could collaborate on the processing and the upgrading, in this case of chromite, so that they would get a better price, right? Because they had an upgraded product um, and they could negotiate essentially as a cooperative with the next level of buyer, right? If you know they're going to go out and sacrifice at that level for their families and for their community, help them at least get some more bang for their buck, right? Like at least help them get a better deal and do it safer, right? With with better equipment, better know-how. I was listening to some, and it's quite interesting though when you, when you talk about that because I was listening to quite, somewhat of a polarizing figure the last couple of days, but you made an interesting point that if you had 100 people and you gave them, each gave them a dollar, over time that $100 would get consolidated among the top 10 or top whatever number, and then it would be, then it would come down to the top 10, then sort of distributing some of what they got to the other people to keep them going. And I think the same thing tends to happen in these environments. They're, they are very much places that are survival of the fittest. At the end of the day, you might start everyone off level, but at the end of the day, some are smarter than others and the wealth is going to get consolidated among a few. And I think that's, whether that's artisanal mining or wherever else, we see that same trend throughout humanity. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and again, I think that's something that perhaps in the West, we choose not to acknowledge, right? Um, or we in kind of are choosing to be naive about other cultures. We have this very rosy picture of, of how other countries and markets operate when in reality, they're not all that different than our own, right? And here in America, 
an entrepreneur who did better than everybody else is celebrated. But for some reason, when we picture it as someone in Africa, we expect everyone to sit around and be collaborative and share everything, right? I mean, it's like, that's not how we are, for sure. (laughs) And a lot of that, I think, comes back to, to racism and the lack of education about other communities. But I really do believe that there are strengths in social structures and traditions in other parts of the world. And in any way that you can work within that in a way that helps people advance the the technical aspect of the work that they're doing and the business aspect so they can sell into larger companies, perhaps, right? Continue to work at a local level, mine at a small level, but put that money into the larger ecosystem in a more legitimate space, help them compete with the black market, right, is one step forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the challenge, you know, the big challenge we have in our world at the moment, and it's it's probably as bad now as it's ever been, and that is the disconnect we have among countries and cultures. And because we've got, we've got this disconnection, we're prone to see the, for want of a better term, the destruction of those around us because they don't matter to us because we haven't got a connection with them. When we have connection, whether it be environment or people or whatever, that's when we tend to take care and look after each other more than we do when we, we get in this world of survival. You know, so I said survival of the fittest before, but it's all about self rather than the collective. Is that part of the power, I would imagine, of what you do with your photography is creating a more direct and personal relationship for the people who are, who are looking at your photos? Yeah, so you talk to a lot of the, some of the most famous photographers of the 20th century and there was a school of thought that you didn't caption your photos and you because you let people interpret them as they saw fit. I don't subscribe to that school of thought because for starters, when you frame a photograph, straight away you're choosing what element you want to give to the viewer. And I think, and it's my view that with the photos and the captions together, it offers an opportunity to school people up in the to school people up on the topic more quickly than they otherwise might have if they were left to their own devices. I mean, we just had a Australia's national broadcaster came out with a story, an article today on cobalt in the Congo. Oh, the word I want to use, I won't use because of your audience, but it was just garbage. They need to be held to account, and people need to pull them up on this stuff because that goes out to the mainstream population, and a lot of the mainstream population take that as fact and. If they had done their basic due diligence and homework, the message going out would have been really, really different. And that's another part of the problem that we have. So I hope that through my work, I can educate people and ultimately bring about change in the sector. And the change that I want to bring about is that if we're going to impose change on these people, then we need to have a plan in place for what happens next, not just say you sort it out for yourselves. Well, thank you again, Hugh, so much for, for coming on. It's been a real pleasure to, to talk to you and get to know you a little bit better after having been LinkedIn friends for a while. And I'm really excited to, to watch your projects continue to come out. And my last question, you sort of already answered maybe, but I've been asking all of my guests, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the mining industry, what would you change? The one thing that comes to mind is a problem they alone can't solve, and that's driven by, you know, the population around the world is 7.6 or 7.7 billion. The second layer of that, the second layer of my answer to that would be that before we start judging people in their backyard, how about we look at our own backyard and fix fix the problems up that we can fix rather than put the pressure on others to fix problems that putting the the onus on other people to fix their own problems rather than us dealing with our problems. And I think that, you know, that could apply anywhere in life really. Absolutely. Well, I'll I'll cheers to that, even though it's coffee. (laughs) Look forward to staying in touch and having you uh, back on soon. Absolutely, Emily. Thanks a lot for taking the time to talk. Hugh Brown outro take two. Thank you to our guest and my colleague, Hugh Brown, for joining us on this episode of On the Rocks. To learn more about Hugh and his work, visit him on LinkedIn, Facebook, and at his website, hughbrown.com and cruelestearth.com. For more insights on new mining projects, mining news, and more, go to our website at prospectorportal.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Nugget. Thanks for joining us on The Rocks. If you enjoyed the episode, click the subscribe button and please leave a review. Until next time, keep your glasses full and your ice cold. Cheers.